Apparently Bob won't be here until 3 o'clock, but I would like to call the meeting to order. Um, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Do we have a second? I'll second it. <laughs> Same time. Uh, also, if we could just go around the room and introduce ourselves. We've got some people here that uh, are new. Okay. I'm John Wood from the Learning Assistance Center. Denise Albright, Secretary at ULPNS. Uh, Dave Grouse, Facilities. Anthony Brown, uh, Fiscal. Danny Hammond from the Community Education Center. Maria Descalso, <laughs> Fiscal Services. Resource representative. Kent Yamauchi, uh, Special Services uh, and rep Management Representative. Chelsea Glover Odom, filling in for Andrew Bott from uh, Finance Committee. Cindy Shimusi, Assistant to oh. Bob. Uh, Keith Oberlander, I'm in the Mathematics Department. Would you two introduce oh, um, yourself? Tiffany Rosso from the PCC Courier. Matthew Chan, PCC Courier. Dr. Thank you all. I think Maria was going to give us some information on the budget. <clears throat> okay. Well, we have a motion on the floor, don't we? I thought it was a second. Oh, yeah. Uh, are there any uh, corrections, changes, improvements? You just tell me what. All those in favor? Approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous? Go ahead, Maria. Okay. okay, this topic is about Budget 101. It's it's a basic budget introduction, and we have designed this presentation in such a way you can correlate it exactly with how the district's financial statements are. Okay. First, we want to discuss what is the definition, the components, and importance of a budget, because it's always the groundwork of every plan. What is a budget? It is a plan of proposed expenditure for operations and estimated revenue for a given period of time. When you say given period of time, we always look at the fiscal year. It's from July 1 to June 30 here at the district. It's, we have a proposed expenditure depending on our priorities, and revenues are always based on, I would say, 90% coming from the state budget of what we would get because we are a state agency. We depend heavily on state money. <clears throat> Our books carry these following funds. We have the general unrestricted fund, which we call the fund one, general restricted funds, debt service fund, child development, capital outlay, building fund, and scheduled maintenance. Let's discuss one by one the, the fund one, which is the general unrestricted fund. This is what we are commonly used to. This is what we use for our operational, for our educational needs. The fund three, which is the general restricted funds, normally we would put anything there which are restricted. They have very specific purposes. One of those are grants, which we cannot use the funds for our operation, simply for our operation. They have very specific purposes, like categorical funding. Those are grants, like the SPS, EOPNS. Those are very specific to the program that we need to use them. Even parking fees are very specific. We cannot just use it. Fund 29 is a debt service fund. It's simply a fund that we establish to make sure we are able to meet our long-term debt. For instance, our old parking lot, which was financed by a COP, Certificate of Participation. We make sure every year we put the money in there so we can meet our obligation. We include that as part of our budgeting money to pay the COPs coming out of parking fees that we collect. So we make sure every year we put money to pay our yearly and that is that will mature until next year for that um, parking lot. Fund 33 is the child development. We have that as one of our centers. Fund 41, which is the capital outlay fund. Historically, the capital outlay fund used to be funded by the state when we have the library built that was funded by the state and we do the reimbursement. State has stopped funding Fund 41. So currently, monies in there are really district, are coming from the district. Any excess that we have from our operation surplus during the year, we try to fund Fund 41 for projects, which we say one-time projects, they're not ongoing. For instance, currently we have put up certain amount of money for our new banner system. We're changing the system. The state do not fund that. 
So that came all from our general fund, the money from our general fund. We were putting money little by little in order we can meet that goal of us in a specific time frame. Fund 42 is the building fund. This is measure P. This is the 150 bond measure that was passed that is being used uh, to build the arts building right now. And also we had the campus center part of this project. Fund 43 is a scheduled maintenance fund that also, I believe, 2008, 2009, prior to those years, the state was giving us money for the maintenance of certain parts of the campus and that also stopped. We're not getting any scheduled maintenance from the state. So any long-term maintenance that we have to do within the district, we need to fund it through our fund one again. So looking at your fund 41 and 43, the burden is shifting from the state to the district to fund those. Yeah, on, on the uh, capital outlay fund, I, I believe that they're going to the state for uh, U building to try to fund that uh, through the state. But if that if they it is funded, is that going to come to the capital outlay fund again, or is it going to go to uh, the unrestricted or the restricted? Fund? Well, if they're going to fund the building itself, that goes to a capital fund, which is fund 41. It's not going to restrict it. You can view the fund 41, 42, and 43 as kind of restricted too, because it's it cannot be used as an operating fund. Capital outlay is like one time and generally to build buildings or acquire one-time big project equipment. So they're kind of in a way restricted. Okay, mm -hmm. so you cannot, we usually don't put that in fund three because this fund 41 is a capital outlay project restricted only to capital outlay. Then we got the Fund 59, this is the fingerprinting services. I think you're familiar with the live scan and the passport services that the district <coughs> offer. And we have four types of self-insurance fund. Fund 60, uh, our workman's compensation. We carry our own workman's compensation. So if somebody files workman's comp, we have our own property and liability that is for all the district properties. Dental coverage, we also pay out our own dental. I think we contract Keenan to help us and we got Delta Dental but we do fund those our own. It's not like a premium that's being paid and the supplemental health got to be 45 which most of you are familiar with. These are the post-employment benefits that we give out to our retirees once they retire and they're eligible to get that benefit. And the fund 74 are strictly the financial aid fund scholarship. Those are also kind of restricted because they are highly dedicated for scholarship of our students, which are the sources of those are federal funding like Pell grants, state like Pell grant. Most of you are familiar with most students. Uh, I do have uh, the question on, on that, on the, uh, the fingerprint services. Okay, now they generate uh, their own money over there, correct? The Does that money go into the fingerprint uh, services or do we have to keep funding it? No, the fingerprinting services, they're called the enterprise fund, like a business. They keep their money. They're supposed to be self-sufficient. It should be run like a business. Mm -hmm. So they have their own revenue, they have their own expenses separate from the district. And have, have they been uh, Funding that, I mean, have we been supplementing it over the past few years or no? For the past, I would say two years, three years, we haven't. We're kind of self subsistence. The only thing we try to help the Fund 59 is with their cash flow so far, I could remember, because there will be times that we need, I mean, just like the district, they would need some money to pay for the Department of Justice bills when we haven't collected everything. So. They're in a tight cash flow situation, so normally we will do what we call temporary cash infusion to them through minor change, uh, move of expenditure, but once they collect, we move it out. So for the past two to three years, I don't think we have 
given them money. So, but in the, initially they were being supplemented, but the last two or three years they've been pretty self-sufficient. I wouldn't so. say supplemented fund 59 did not really exist from the start. It was really part of the district as a cost center. And then they decided to create its own fund separate and district, distinct from the district. That's why it got its own separate mm -hmm. revenue and expenditure. Okay. I also have a question about the dental coverage. I, I know that they, they've tried to explain it before. I still don't understand because they, you guys are saying that we're self-insured, but we have a Delta Dental card and we go through Delta Dental, so we must be paying some kind of a premium to Delta Dental, so I don't understand how we're, how, how, so I just don't understand, so. Okay. <laughs> you think you can explain it? I'll try. So I can understand? I'll try. We have a broker. Keenan is our broker for this. They hire Delta Dental to assist us with the function to service the dental needs of our people. But we don't pay premium, just like a regular, regular health insurance that you would pay premium. We don't pay premium. Okay. They pay those providers and then we pay based on the claims submitted to us that's why we call it self-insured compared to our health and the welfare we are we are not self-insured for our health and welfare because we pay premiums to anthem blue cross Right. That's not self-insured. That's right. not. Okay. Delta is, that's why you call so, it self-insured. So we don't pay a premium to Delta Dental, but Keenan contracts with Delta Dental to basically run our self-insurance program. Yes. Okay. Did it help? It helped. Okay. <laughs> well, one thing I'd like to ask is, if, could we get a breakdown of what we are paying Keenan and Associates? When you say breakdown, is it the administrative fee that we pay? Well, they, they, they do a lot here, correct? I mean, they, they do our uh, health and benefits, our de Delta Dental, uh, our uh, workman's, uh, workman's comp. comp, all that. I mean, uh, I like to see, you know, how much Delta Dental is actually charging us. For Keenan, Keenan. Or Keenan, Keenan, I'm sorry, yeah. Keenan. Yeah, we can get that. Okay. We have a vendor file. We so just do we have like separate contracts for these different services that they do? That's the, I think that's what you're looking for, right? Yeah. How, how much we pay them to have them have Delta Dental run our dental program and I don't know what other things they do. They I guess they negotiate our, our health mm -hmm. and welfare and mm -hmm. all that. So, yeah, that would be they give us a lot of services, actually. Okay, let me get that for you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so we're done with the funds. Cindy, what's next? Components. Okay. So we go to the components, which is the first one is the revenue. And <clears throat> if you go further to the revenue, you will see that there's... Next one? <laughs> These are the major sources of our revenue. The federal, state, local, and others. We really don't have, if you look at fund one, which is the general unrestricted fund, we really don't have a lot of federal revenue in fund one, simply because mostly those are consists of the administrative allowances from our federal grants. We are having, we have, a, we have a lot of federal revenue when it comes to the financial aid component because we have a huge financial aid and those are federal revenue. In terms of state revenue, we have a lot in terms of the general unrestricted fund because of our general apportionment and the state lottery. Local revenue, we have a majority in property taxes and student fees like our enrollment fees, out of state tuition, that's all student fees. Those are the major components of our local revenue. Okay, but the student fees, uh, the local student fees, uh, we were told at least in the past, we don't keep those, we send those to the state, or they deduct that amount from the apportionment they send us one, one or the other. Actually, we, would, we don't send it back in, don't think that we cut a check sending it back to the state. 
when the state give us the state general apportionment, there are three components when they do that. Mm -hmm. One is the property tax, and one is the enrollment fee. They call it the triple flip. They have a certain formula. There is a base that we are guarantee whether we have enough FTAS or not. There's a base. On top of that, they built in, based on your FTAS, how much money they are supposed to give you. But then they would deduct how much property taxes that you're getting. So, in theory, it's like they're kind of back feeling they're at the end in terms of computation this the general apportionment is at the end after they look at how much revenue you got from prop from your property taxes how much enrollment fee you got then there's a time your general apportionment kicks in but the local fees for somebody who's a, a California resident and like f1 fees those are treated differently right because we get to keep all the f1 fees is that, is that right the mm -hmm. out of state not only the... Uh, yeah, out okay. of state and F1, sorry. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. Out of state and international student out of state tuition, we get to keep that. That doesn't get reported to the state. Right, okay. Marie, can, excuse me, can I ask a question? How much do we get in lottery money? Do you know? Uh, last year it was $2 million plus. I have to look at that. And the lottery money has two components, actually portion of the lottery money is given to the general fund, a portion is to cover um, instructional supplies. Classroom, direct instructional supplies only. So smart classrooms would fall under that? It has to be a supply. Oh, a supply, okay. It, cannot so it can't be, be like a, a projector or anything to go into a classroom? Not an equipment. Okay. It has to be instructional supplies. It's, sure. Yeah, it's different from... It's different from <laughs> instructional equipment. Okay? It's, it's instructional supply. <laughs> so on, in the okay. budget, though, the general <laughs> apportionment is, is do they separate out the state lottery revenues from general apportionment? Because I don't ever remember seeing. Yes, we do. Okay. We separate the general apportionment yes. from the lottery and from the enrollment. They're all separate. So they're on they're separate line items yes, under they have. revenues. Okay. okay, I'm sorry, I have a question. For student fees, I just want to sort of understand this better because I'm a student, and when I pay student fees, then where does that money, I know you sort of explained it, but there's a lot of terms that I'm sort of not accustomed to. What happens? Okay. If you're a student, mm -hmm. assuming you don't have a bog waiver. Okay. Okay. You pay your enrollment fee. The enrollment fee goes to the general fund. That becomes, again, as what Danny was saying, mm -hmm. We show that as an enrollment fee, yet we need to report it to the state because they use that to compute the apportionment that we're supposed to get okay. eventually. Okay. It's like we keep it for cash flow purposes, okay. but it is factored in when they compute the general apportionment. Okay. okay. So did I answer your question? If you were an out-of-state Student, student, you'd be able to retain the funds. I'm able to retain the fund for the out-of-state tuition only. For the tuition only? Tuition only. Okay. So the enrollment fees, if I don't have a BOG fee waiver, so that it goes towards like the units and things like that, that goes to the school. Then from the school, you hold it as cash flow just so you have money, but it all gets calculated by the state. Right. And from the state, then it goes towards the property tax. No, from the state. It goes, we, we the money gets that. taken out, right? So it's like, as far as the state is concerned, this is what we were supposed to get. Uh -huh. They will identify how much is the enrollment fee. Okay. They will identify how much is the property taxes that we get. Mm -hmm. So the difference, the state will give us the money. Okay. So that's your revenue from that. Okay. I got you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Marie, what, do you know what percentage of the local property tax we get, and do we get it just from in the in-district property? I, only in-district. I didn't know we got property tax. I thought that all went to the state, but we get a certain mm -hmm. percentage of it. Okay. The way I understood this, because of the Prop 98, mm, we yeah. elected to get property tax during the time there were... I know like the Cal, Cal State, 
they decided not to but we decided like to go with the k-12 the k-12 gets property tax so do we get property tax so we, it's within the district that we get the property tax but it doesn't increase the total amount we get they just subtract that because they figure out what we are owed and then whatever we've collected from the student fees and those property taxes they subtract and then they send us our apportionment. So it doesn't really increase what we're getting yep. in apportionment, correct? Yep. So what's the incentive to try for any of that local money? If we're going to get, they otherwise they would reimburse us fully? Are you talking about that discussion we had last, whenever it was, about trying to just get our funding from, from local taxes? No, no, I'm just trying to understand. Well, there was a discussion, I don't know when it was, that was about eight months ago. Where right. we, there, there's another way, I don't fully understand it, so I probably shouldn't be talking about yeah, but that we get, Where you get, you, you get all your funding from your property, property taxes. taxes, you don't get an apportionment. But Currently, if you're, there are only three districts in California of the 155 community colleges that are uh, basics, sufficient, it, 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 I forgot. There's that that Marin, they College right. of Marin. They, the College of Marin, right, so they are totally yeah. self Funded. The nice thing yeah. about that is that it's consistent funding. We're not looking at the year-to-year -year budget, yeah. um, unlike we are when we think about um, state funding, right? So if the state has something go wrong, then we're dependent on that, which is why we got the um, the uh, spring surprise last year. Mm -hmm. But if we were, a, I think it's called like a basic skills right. district, then you didn't have to worry about that because you're not dependent on state okay. funds. So one of the reasons why we were looking at it is because Pasadena might be able to move towards that more consistent funding by looking at the local property tax. You need to be a very wealthy district. Yeah, you need yes. to be a nicer And district. Pasadena, right. yes. Right. I know we're close to I think the Marin only County. problem there is because you're also, you also have to look at the K-12 district mm -hmm. because once you get all the property tax, they're getting lesser. So I think that was the impact of that. So, so it negatively impacts the K through 12s in the area. Yeah. And so, okay. Depending on the wealth of your yeah. Yeah. district, right? Your district. Moran is not hurting. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, you, you talk about the lottery money, and it, is there a law that says you can only use the lottery money for certain things, yes. or is that the way the school uh, decided no, to use it? That's a law, it? and that's what happened. It's because that was based on a K 12 model. Um, and the idea was that we were not supply supplying schools like elementary schools with enough chalk, paper, et cetera. And that's where that came in. Crayons. Exactly. So that's a lot. They call it Prop 20. Okay. Only for instructional supplies. For I, sure. I have another question. You know when the stands are here for Rose Bowl, for the Rose Parade, do we get money from the city? for having their bleachers sitting on our property? It's not actually the city. There is a private company who pays us and oh, okay. that goes to, I think, fund for two one. Okay. I can double check that for you. Yeah. But okay. every year we get like a formal like rental for that. It comes to us. Is that from Sharp Seed? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. And the band fest, that's also paid by the Rose Parade, correct? By the Rose people? Terminal yeah. Rose Association, yes. Terminal Rose is, yeah. yeah. We so, they, they rent the facility. So it goes to Capital Outlay then? Yep. I will double check that for you, Denise. Okay. But I'm Thank you. Going is it, it line itemed out as to the amount? You can see it if you want to look at the books. Okay. But it's not a specific line just to show that. It goes to the revenue and I can show, I can give you an audit trail if you want to. Yeah, okay. okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Okay. Just kidding. Types of expenditures. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So we're now on the different types of expenditures, which you are very familiar with. First is your academic salaries, and they're all the 1,000 objects. Classified salaries. You're familiar with the classified employees. Employees benefit, they include majority of these are the health and the welfare and the retirement benefits that we pay. Then you've got your supplies and other operating next next is there a next one other operating expenses which include your utilities travel and conferences legal and audit consultants those are all other operating expenses and we got the 6000 object which are your equipment purchases <coughs> and the 7000 generally these are the reimbursement of 
certain student expenses that we allow. But you see this mostly with grants, which is on the restricted fund. There's some grants that allow us to pay for some students' uh, metro passes. So we use that account generally. And lastly, we have the different types of fund balances. We, we have the reserve, which are the legally restricted to a specific future use, designated when we designate a portion for what we intend to use it for a future period, and the unrestricted, which is available for future appropriation. But in the district, it was just a practice for us. We call it the fund balance. Why is budgeting very important and the role of the budget committee very important? Because again, initially we said it's a plan, it's a guide how we're going to operate. It's also a tool to help <coughs> manage the expenditures and resources. We wanted to make sure we are within budget, especially your expenditures. And it also helps us measure the financial outcome based on our objectives. So if our objective is to achieve certain FTEs, we know if we're achieving it based on the parameters of the expenditures that we have set. And if we have surpluses, we can plan for future needs or we can set what we want so in the future we can provide for those. That's why the budget is very important even if it's only a plan. It's a very important financial plan. It's a tool. Here's the challenge that we are all face. Moving forward, we need to develop a new way of do it, doing a budget based on the latest budget information we have from Sacramento. Things will be changing from the basic FTEs. They're doing it now more into transfers, completion. It's a different way of doing it. Guidelines on those will come in later, so that's the one we're trying to work on, at least to provide the different areas with some information, financial information, how we can move towards that goal. But they haven't actually passed any laws that change the funding from FTES at this point. There's discussion of changing it, but it hasn't actually passed, Right, there's, there, there, yeah, there's discussion right now of um, changing from what's known as seat time, census time at right. the third week of a given semester, whatever body's in that seat, they will pay on that, versus the notion of paying on completion, uh, actual students who achieve uh, certain uh, uh, goals, whether it's, a, whether it's a degree or a transfer or a certificate, or whether it's just continuing successfully in, in a pathway. Uh, as uh, I, I had an opportunity to see uh, 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 Chancellor Harris talk last night, our new community college chancellor, and, and he said that's going to be a long-fought discussion. There's a lot of concern about that statewide, a lot of education for legislators because uh, it would really, really be very problematic for the system. So whether or not that happens, um, well, first of all, whether or not it happens, I think there's a good chance it won't happen at the moment, or if it does happen, it'll be... It won't happen, I don't think, for at least a year or two while they try to figure out the way to damage. As he said, legislation like that has a great deal of unintended consequences that people don't realize until two years after the fact. So he, as our chancellor and our board of governors, are going to fight that tooth and nail. Well, the governor seems to be stressing the importance of moving funds to those districts that have heavier challenges or more impoverished areas. Or Particularly for K-12. Oh, that, that's his emphasis on K-12. And this type of formula seems like it would uh, benefit wealthier districts or more prepared districts. That's absolutely correct. And that's a very good point, John, because the chancellor last night said, said that. It, it, it will, in, in his opinion, it increases the d divide between the haves and the have-nots. That's what I'm thinking. Okay? Because those who have will, 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 will sail through this more, more than likely, um, whereas those who have come from a less... Uh, um, uh, what I guess I would call less um, positive backgrounds, if you will, you know, uh, will have other issues that they're dealing with. Yeah, first language and preparation. Have you guys done project, uh, projections on what would happen to our funding if it did go to the end of the uh, semester rather than the third week? We have not, but I can tell you that it would be Armageddon. 
it would be very difficult for us and all the other 70, there's 72 community college districts, everybody would have a <coughs> massive problem because we all know what the retention rates are. We all know who the completers are. We all know what happens. So it would, uh, it would be incredibly uh, disruptive, if not destructive. That's so right now online. there's been no actual change in how we're funded. Right it's now, there's been no discussion. actual change. No, the only the, the only issues right now is um, we are one of the few districts in the state that was able to respond to the reinstatement of the workload that was taken away from us pre Prop Prop 30. We were able because of of, of our calendar situation. Now we were able to um, quickly load back additional classes for the spring and because we have kind of a dual summer session opportunity before June 30th, we have a shot at actually collecting back our 1200 and 1250 FTES. Uh, many districts were not able to do that because they had already canceled their winters. Uh, they didn't, and some of them were able to quickly throw them back but they weren't able to put them back as quickly as they would have wanted to. Most districts are reporting to the Chancellor's Office right now that they are not going to be able to uh, recapture the FTS. One of the, one of the Prop 30 surprises everybody is that even though Prop 30 passed, which was great, and even though we, we all got the reinstatement of the FTS, which was great, the big surprise was is that they required us, us being the community colleges, to recapture that FTS within 12-13. And that caught many districts flat-footed because they hadn't they hadn't planned for that. So now, what I what I predict is going to happen is we're going to get to June 30th, and there's going to be a whole lot of money left on the table because districts were not able to respond quickly enough to put those courses into their systems. And those of us who who were, we're all going to be competing with ourselves because again, the system not again the system went from what was it. Uh, Oh, let's see. Uh, we we went from 2.8 million students that we served at its high water mark in 2007-8 down to 2.3 million students. So we've lost a half a million students because of this recession. Those students are still of the mind that they that there's no room in the inn. Those students haven't yet figured out that there's opportunity to come back to these classes. Those students don't have it for their lives. So. It's not like you're going to be able to find a half million students and throw them back into the system overnight. People have got to plan for that. So it's going to take time for the system to recover. The other thing is we were on a, we were on a growth, growth point of 2.8 million. We were heading to, uh, to 3 million students that we were serving. But all that, all that wind was taken out of the sail now. So it's going to take some time to recover everything. And if we have time, I've got a budget presentation where I'll talk a little bit about that. It's not a quick recovery, is my yeah. point. But uh, at two, when it comes down to the end, the Board of Governors can just, uh, can, can they waive that uh, FTS ruling and just give them the, the proportionate that they... That's correct. You're absolutely right, Dave. At the end of the day, they could, they, they could do a couple of things. They could reward, as they've done in the past, districts that were able to do it and provide them the, that, the money plus additional growth money. Maybe they went beyond what their, what their uh, workload reduction, that reinstatement was, and they, got, they went beyond that. They can say, okay, we're going to pay you for going beyond because we've got the extra money to do that. That's happened to this district in the past. Uh, or they can say, you know what, what we asked to do was unreasonable, so we're going to extend that opportunity into 13-14 so you can actually recover it, which is what we all thought they were going to do anyway and give us more time next year to, to grow back, which is probably a more likely scenario, uh, frankly. Um, but yeah, no, the Board of Governors has that authority to do that. Now, they've, they've got to get the agreement of the Department of Finance. and Because the thing I have to remember very quickly is that whereas the CSU and the UCs are islands in, in and of themselves and can really control themselves, the community colleges are a little, are not quite the same way. They've got to negotiate um, more with the Department of Finance uh, on these things. Although they tell us, uh, I've heard, I've been in a couple meetings of this again stated last night, that the relationship between the Department of Finance and the California Community College Chancellor's Office and the Board of Governors is better than it's been in years. There's a real lockstep. They're working with very well together. And people are really celebrating that fact. Uh, so that's, that's actually probably good news for all of us.
I just have a quick question. I know that you said that there's more funding, I guess, coming into the school system now, and that we're going to be hoping for a reboot soon. Um, does that mean that more classes are going to be offered for students, or what kind of classes are going to be offered to help them sort of progress? Well, definitely we're going to try to offer more courses for students. Okay. We are, uh, through Dr. Bell's office and uh, Dean Ariano's office, uh, uh, and through a lot of other people, there's, a, there's a, a real emphasis on developing a strategic enrollment management plan that focuses on offering sections that students really need to graduate, transfer, and get their certificates. Okay. And because there's more money, we are offering more sections. So we added, don't quote me, but 200 plus sections this spring. I don't remember the exact number. We are planning to offer uh, just at 800 or just over 800 over the dual summer sessions. Last summer we offered 260 or 250. So absolutely we are planning to spend that money or the majority of that money on additional sections. Okay, great, thank you. If, assuming we, we get all the money we think we're gonna get. And actually we, we are hopeful, and Marie and I and Joe, we're still waiting for the numbers from the Chancellor's office. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, we don't have any real numbers yet to hang our hat on. They're still trying to figure it out themselves. But as far as how much FTS we're gonna get funded for? How much FTS we're gonna get funded for, how that transfers, how much redevelopment agency money we're gonna get, how much, uh, Prop 39 money we're going to get, how much, Everything is everything's up in the air. What everybody knows is there's more money. They just haven't quite figured out how it's going to be allocated yet. Is that a fair thing? Yep. Fair way of saying it, right? We don't have the final ones yet. Right. Okay. So that's a whole lot of... <clears throat> okay, we have a few questions here. Most people are asking, how do we do our budget right now? I mean, basically, we do a rollover budget, which most of you are familiar, and we do some adjustments based on the rollover budget. And again, since a budget is a plan, it doesn't mean you're stuck with it. You still have some small flexibility, I would say. Why small? Because most of our expenditures are on salaries and on benefit. So you can still do some budget transfers. If you have to, between your discretionary accounts, like 4000 5000 and Anthony's here to help you do that if you want to. So, uh, we would also recommend that if you can work within your area and you find there is a department who has excess money and they're willing to work with you, you might want to work with them. So you can also do budget transfer with, for instance, one call center, which is on the general fund, unrestricted fund, to another call center if they allow you to do that. Okay, there, there's no need for their money. If you want to use it, they allow you, we can allow that. So there's some flexibility. And why do we, we maintain a fund balance? We always wanted to maintain a fund balance. One big advantage for the district of having a good fund balance was during tight cash problem that we have, we were able to use that to meet our daily needs, especially our payrolls. I'm talking both on the general fund and some of the other funds, like in fund 64, which is the GASB 45 for the OPEC. Since we're just funding it, it's not on an irrevocable trust, we're not fully compliant because to comply we need we that means we have to put the money on an irrevocable trust. We never have done that. We were just funding based on actuarial study. So last June when we fell short of money to pay our payroll, we were able to borrow money from that fund to pay our payroll for at least one month until the money from the state of about 19 million came in. So that was a big help. That's why it's also important to have good fund balances. It's a reserve. You can have emergency, which you never budgeted for. So there will be times you will need it. And again, there will be certain future needs, as I mentioned to you earlier, like fund 41, 43, those are no longer state funded. So if you have a big balance in there, the board can approve that we transfer some of those 
fund reserve in there to fund other funds where we need most. So it's always it's look at it as your own personal account if you have some savings account. When you have emergency, you cannot predict your day-to-day -day expenses. There'll be some, you need this which you never budgeted for. But if you have something on the side in your savings account, you get into there. And as a wise man would do, you would always replenish that. Put it back. So that when time comes, you always have something to get. It's as simple as that. Now the fund budget, you're talking about reserves, correct? Okay, and you say it's required by law. I thought that community colleges did not... I mean, you don't never want one. I mean, I'm not going to say that. But I didn't think that the uh, state required you to have a uh, fund balance. There is. Yeah, there three, is three, three to five percent. Yeah, to keep in reserve. Yeah, but we, we have about 18, 19 yeah. percent. Our, our, our board has taken a position. Danny's right. It's three to five percent, typically five. But our board has taken the position that they like to have at least 12 million in what they would call a reserve, a hard reserve. Uh, we have another give or take six million, six million. right? Uh, that is that is in that fund. So we usually keep about eighteen million give or take uh, in what might be called a rainy day fund or or whatever you might want to call that. Um, the um, there has been talk about trying to get that number up as high as twenty five or thirty million. So that if this ever happens to us again, we're we're that that, that we're that better off. So I'm not sure where we'll go with that, okay. but uh, but there has been talk about. But now you also have us uh, Gatsby 45. You have what about 20 some million in that? Yeah, that is and that is required by law. That's the, the Gatsby 45 relates to our um, uh, our extended benefits and stuff like that. Exactly, it's it's it's, it's it's our un it's our pension. Well, it's our it's a liability fund tied to our retirees. It's our retirees. It's an obligation that we have to our retirees. It's tied primarily to the people who are 65 and over, and uh, roughly the, the benefit that we've provided them uh, of roughly $1,400, $1,500 a year uh, for uh, whatever they want to use it for, but usually it's used to help pay for supplemental insurance to cover, uh, to go beyond Medicare. Uh, and, and also the insurance for the 55 through 65. Yeah, right. And that's yeah. as well. And that's the bigger piece of it, right? That's, yeah, that's the yeah. big part of it. And we fund that two ways every year. You want to talk about that very briefly? Well, we fund it, two, when Bob says two ways, we fund one as part of the ongoing, and the other one is for the long term. Unfortunately, for the past two years, we were only funding it for the ongoing because of the budget crisis, we have stopped funding the long-term portion of it based on the actuarian who did speak to us, the consultant, based on what we have accumulated in the fund, we were kind of good not to contribute for the long-term, a year or two, but we cannot continue on doing that. So, so basically, from an actuarial point of view, we have to have about 17 or 18 million dollars always set aside to fund the long-term obligation. Annually, we have to contribute about a million... 1.4. About a million four annually to keep up with it. Now, again, actuarially, although we're getting to the point where we have to check this again, we were about two million or so to the good. So instead of, instead of budgeting during a tight budget year that 12-13 was, another payment of the 1.4 we actually took it from the amount of money that we had. Right. We, stopped. We, stopped, we, stopped, mm -hmm. we stopped investing and we used that money to pay the yearly obligation. We, more we or kept less. it in the general fund. In the general it fund. It was overfunded. So it was you, overfunded you by about to me. What you yeah. needed in there. Right. So instead of making the payment, you're, you're exact. Okay. But now it may not be overfunded anymore. So that was one little budget trick that we used to, you know, to, to help balance the budget last year. Now, at the same time, though, we are underfunded in, in workman's comp. There you go. Based on the latest actuarial study, we have a potential liability on workman's comp of about $2 million. We are short by about $1.8 So that's another area that we need to raise funds to fund it. We can do it two ways. 
One way is to keep on increasing our workmen's compensation rate that is tied up to our salary. Like for the past two years, we have increased it, but not dramatically. In terms of absolute amount, we were only increasing it by 200,000, I have increased it. But to fund the 1.8, that would take us like 10 years. So if we want to do aggressively, if we have a surplus in fund one, we can do transfer from fund one to fund 61 to cover that potential liability. And we will likely make some recommendation of some type to, to uh, if not fund it all this year, to fund a, a good chunk of it to try and get, get a little more caught up on it. So are we saying that more people are filing for IA? Is that the reason? Yes. Okay, have we explored some other options? Uh. You mean to try to take our workers' comp rate down? Yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we're aggressively working. In fact, um, you know, the thing about workers' comp I'm learning, and Joe can tell us this, and Marie, is that sometimes these claims go on for yes. years. And, and sometimes they pay out for years, or you get to the end of a three- or four-year thing and you got a $100,000 bill. bill or something. And, and so even though you always want to go for a lower experience rate, and we, and we are getting better on that, uh, you just never know what's going to happen, and it's just the way the way it is. Do we have a, a surplus in the old one account every year? Yes, I would it seems say, like. Well, it, I, right? say, I would I mean, say so far, yes. Yeah, and how much is it average? Do you know? It's averaged five point five million dollars for the last eight years. Wow, Danny. Okay. No, Danny, when you say average, that's every year. That's on average. That's the last year was one point eight million. Yeah, because because we use it. Yeah, and I think, oh, okay. and, and then all that money went into the infamous Fund 41 for years. And so this year, we're going to bring to this group a recommendation that it not go to Fund 41, but that if, in fact, it happens, it goes to certain prescriptive areas. For example, um, we, are, we might recommend to the group uh, a new technology fund uh, that we might use to re you know to we might put x hundreds of thousands of dollars in there every year for our computer refreshes that we have to do on a regular basis uh, we might recommend uh, that uh, we uh, um, put two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year into the so-called reserve account I mean there's a come into my book my office on my board there I've got a list of things I you mean know, my wish list of things that we might want to do if we have extra money but we're not just going to salt it away into the so-called Fund 41. We're going to be a little more prescriptive about where we would like the money to go. A little bit more transparent, too, to be quite honest with you, um, about where the money goes. And, uh, um, and eventually somebody around here is going to want some raises. So uh, we're going to have to talk about that, too. <laughs> It's been a while, right? So I, I just got Six one more years question. Uh, in, in the years past... Who's counting? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Approximately. Right. Uh, in the years past, the travel and uh, conference accounts was kind of split up to where the uh, departments had so much money that they could spend, and if they went over, you could, there was like a uh, vice president's office or whatever that you try to get extra money from, because you guys always have reserves on that. Is that has that changed? Uh, no, but I will tell you this: that, um, that we are exploring. Uh, we had a meeting just the other day. Uh, with uh, Crystal and Joe and, and Marie and I, and we're looking at uh, FTES targets uh, by a discipline wrapped up into the new schools model, and then we're looking at we're, we're looking at the budgeting the budgets for the existing divisions in those disciplines, and we're trying to figure out to, to give a, a target to a division or to a school one of the, the the new school let's say the school of humanities and fine arts or humanities whatever it's going to be, social sciences. And let's say that their FTS target, I'm just going to grab a number, it's, and it's a wild number, don't quote me, but let's just say that their target is 5,000 FTS for the year. Okay? And let's say when you add it all up, that the expenses, the budget, that over a three-year period, their budget for that was this amount of money. Well, we're going to basically say to them, uh, and this is, we're just in the talking stage, is that here's your FTS target, here's your budget, if you can achieve your FTS target and underspend your budget, we're going to let that school keep a certain percentage of what they saved, and then allow that faculty and that and that staff and that and that division or that school management to say, okay, where do we want to put that money? We want to send more of our faculty and staff to conferences. We want to buy more supplies. 
and we want to buy that piece of equipment that we could never afford because we could never get it out of the stingy people up front before. So we're going to basically provide an, a, a, a model by which that they could actually, if they are good stewards of their resources, if you will, um, they can keep some of, the, some of that excess money to, to do things that they might want to do that they couldn't otherwise do. That's just a, a, budgeting, a, a new budgeting kind. And, we're, and when we're ready, we'll bring that into this group and we'll talk about it so you guys can, 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 uh, can have a sense of what, of what we're thinking about. Okay, and that'd be great for faculty. What about classified? Same thing. The point is that, you know, the, the, if we're talking about the academic unit, so the school deans within that structure and whatever she or he has on that structure, staff and faculty and what have you, the same model might go, might be used, for example, in facilities that the same opportunity is there. I mean, we, we would try to implement this so that every, um, uh, every distinct cost center in the, co in the college would have the same opportunity to, uh, you know, to keep some of those proceeds for uh, things that they might not ordinarily get or they'd have a hard time getting the funding for. So it's not just for academic. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it's it would all be for campus. It'd be everything. Okay. I just use schools. It'd be all over. No, it's okay. Campus. I'm just making sure. No, no, it'd be all over. I campus. wanted to go on record. That's right. Then I'm yeah. paying attention. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be everywhere. Yes, sir. Speaking of facilities, it seems like our institution is in disrepair. I mean, I notice it everywhere I go compared to all the years I've been here. Just walking through the R building, chipped paint, and dirt. And is there a plan to address that? There is, and, uh, and that's a great point. Thank you. So I'll ask Cindy to make a note in the minutes. We'll ask Reuben Smith, <coughs> our, our new executive director for facilities, to come in and do a, a short presentation on the deferred maintenance plan Excellent. and the things that we're, we're trying to do. There is somewhere between 40 and $50 million of deferred maintenance on this campus right now. Okay. And we are working diligently with the state. The state finally has some new money for um, uh, deferred maintenance opportunities that you can, if, it's like, if, you know, dollar for dollar. You can, you, your deferred maintenance project has cost $5 million, they'll give you two and a half million, that type of thing. Okay. But you're absolutely right, it is an issue. I mean, we do, and we are much better than many of our I'm sure. places, but uh, it's I'm definitely sure. something. So we'll have Ruben come in and do a presentation. Thank you. Speaking of the maintenance, is there still <coughs> two of the uh, scheduled maintenance? And a deferred maintenance, or is it just all one now? They're the same. They are the same for now until such time as the state reinstates the scheduled maintenance program. Yeah. Bob is referring to deferred maintenance because, based on the project, we should have done those maintenance before. Right. We were just deferring it because we didn't have money. That's, I think that's what he referred to. But well, really, if you look at the financial side of it, that's still part of the scheduled maintenance. Right. This yeah. is Fund 43. Right. Well, I, I didn't think that. Fund 43, state. just to be real clear, because um, I think this is your question, David. Sorry to interrupt you. Fund 43, we got the money from the state to put into Fund 43. And they stopped putting, giving us that money how many years ago? I think 2008 was the last yeah. one they gave us. Yeah. So, so that's why, it, and there's still a little money in there, very little. Very right? little. <laughs> well, well I, know, I know Dr. Costa always put one or two million dollars in there, whether we used it or not. Uh, it was a way of, of right. having money in there, basically not to, for raises and stuff, because it was yeah. kind of restricted. Yeah. But uh, we did. We used to get about what six hundred thousand, I think, and then three hundred thousand in the state. We put in uh, mm -hmm. three hundred thousand. There's each always year. a match of fifty percent. Right. Now, but now it could be that the state would match more. Is that not correct? Yeah. What's happening is we have lost. The system has lost over a billion dollars in cola money, cost of living allowance money. Uh, since the 07-08 uh, crash. Um, the, uh, there, is, there is a plan by 2015-16, or 16-17, maybe it was 16-17, to pay back upwards of um, six or seven hundred million dollars of that one billion, but the rest of it's gone forever. And so this is part of that extra money that may be coming to us as, as, as they try to accelerate the deferral payments, the deferred monies that occurred, that, that they now have because of um, Prop 30 and the ongoing Prop 98. They're going to try and pay the districts back more rapidly if they can. Uh, again, a very significant number of districts, and I would probably say the majority of districts, are in much, much worse financial shape than we are. 
uh, we've been able to weather the storm better than most. So there is a desperate need by those districts to get cash in the door to not only make payroll, but to deal with their $100 million of deferred maintenance and whatever else might be out there. Yeah, but if I understand, unless you have money in the account to show that you have your 50% yes, match, have to match it. Yes, they sir. will not That's fund right. it, is that correct? Yeah. I think Ruben right now is working on a plan, uh, the number 22 million sticks in my mind, that he's that has this deferred maintenance plan. He's working with the state right now to, and this is over a five-year period, to basically match it dollar for dollar. Here's our deferred maintenance plan, and every year we're going to try to get X dollars from the state, and we'll match it with, with what we need to, to get it done. And that'll be part of the budgeting process as well. Okay. Now, in the Prop, um, was it 39? Uh, do we have to match that also when we get the money, or is it a strictly one for one? It's a good. It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that yet. I do know this. I know that um, uh, some some entities are, are defining Prop 39, which is about a 39 million dollars to the California Community Colleges by coincidence, as all 39 money would go to K-12 through higher education. But the Department of Finance is pushing back on that right now, or maybe it's the LAO, the Legislative Analyst Office is pushing back on that right now, saying that those monies really, that the electorate really had the intent of those monies going to all, to a broader spectrum of, of users. So there's going to be a court challenge on that money. But I think to answer your question, now that I think about it for a second, it is going to be require a match as well. And much of that is all about energy efficiency yeah. and, and, and to, uh, you know, to be more efficient. Yeah, but that, that's a wide range of... Um yeah, it could be anything. You're right. We're not anything yeah. here. So there, the, the good news is, is that 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 there's money out there, uh, and 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 the good news is we just haven't heard out heard how we're going to get our hands on it yet. But but we're we're there, and we're there in Sacramento right now for the U building replacement. We're 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 we got a good team of people here that are now working Sacramento and doing the things that we need to do in order to uh, get in line for all this money when the money finally starts flowing. Yeah. So I just have one quick question. When is it when we match the money that we put into our accounts that we'll be able to like progress to do some of the repairs? It's only when we have enough to match what we need, or well, when can we the start answer repairing? now? Because okay. because we have local district money, okay. which we spend every day to maintain the facilities and improve the facilities. Uh, there's three sources. There's the local money. Okay. There's the Measure P money, our bond money for our construction projects. Uh, we've got about three or four hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, concrete repair and walkway repair and lighting repairs occurring right now on Measure P. And then there's this. There, there, there looks like there is again going to be the state deferred maintenance money. For the last five, six years, we've been working only with Measure P and district money. We haven't had the state money to draw down on because it hasn't been coming our way. And that's why the buildings look like they are. Yeah. It, you know, the whole west side of this building, you know, you feel the draft coming in from these windows? These windows, if you breathe on them too hard, they might fall down. I, that's obviously an exaggeration. But, I mean, the, this whole side, of the, this whole west side, all the windows need to be replaced. You know that, Vanilla? Well, no, I have uh, mushrooms growing in my office. Exactly, because so. of the moisture and everything else. It's bad. Good joke. Yeah, but the are they, are they edible? <laughs> um, I'm well. They may be, but I'm not sure the side effects. So we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the but the, the, if you look at the the the, the uh, east side and the and the north side have been done, mm -hmm. but uh, ran out of money for the uh, for the west side. And and the south, a little bit of the yeah, south side. Yeah, a little bit of the south side too. So, um, and that's when the deferred maintenance money, for most part, stopped. But you're getting a brand new building. Are you moving or you're staying? No, we get to keep the mushrooms. You get to keep the mushrooms. Too. <laughs> uh, we get to get to tend the mushrooms. Exactly. Rock, Robert. Yes, sir. Uh, the U building. Are we sure we have to replace it? I mean, has that been decided? Yeah, it's been decided by three different engineers, and, okay. and that uh, that it needs to it needs to come down, and um, and this the, and and the way that we know that that there's validation of that, and Danny, I don't want to get anything up on this, but because we are what's known as a category um, A building because of the, um, uh, the dangers associated, because it's, it's been, it, it has been certified by the state as an unsafe building, which means that we are what's known as a, as a, as a type A property. Uh, the state is telling us that we uh, 
that we can apply for fifty point four million dollars at either fifty four million or fifty point four million to replace that building. And that if the bond money is there and it's increasing looking like it will be there, that we are like uh, we're in tier one and we're like among the top three prop buildings right now that, that because of the emergency situation. Now, having said that, by the time we get through um, the State Architect's Office, Department of DSA, Department of State Architect. By the time we get the, money, the, the funding approval and what have you, it'll be 15, 16 before we can even begin the thought of, of, of maybe building that building. Uh, if, and then what we might try to do, if, depending on how all this continues to play out, is try to get an advance in that money so we can at least take the building down and create a green space while we dance the dance of the design of the DSA and what have you. So it'll, it'll be five years easy before that building is, is replaced. And in the meantime, we are about to commence a very significant, uh, what we're calling a Centennial Facilities Master Planning process for the campus, uh, which uh, might lead us to another uh, bond measure uh, that we would take to the voters in <coughs> two or three years. Yeah, but taking the building down right now, waiting a couple of years might be a problem, unless you're going to take the forum with it. No, the forum will stay. Okay. There's no, the, the, the forum will stay. You know, they'll figure out a way. My point is, right now, it's it's just sitting there, and it's, um, and it costs us money, because the utilities are running in there, everything's happening in there, so. Um, and that is what it is, and we just deal with what it is, so. Uh, but in the in the world of full disclosure, that's where we are with that right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. So to, I guess we're we're at. Um, um, anything else on the budget 101 for either Marie or Joe? Well, it's, it's not budget, it's cash flow, but how are we, have we had to borrow from that TRAN money at all? Oh, yes. good. Yeah, yeah, we can go the, ahead. The, the TRAN money came last December, mm -hmm. so we got $10 million for the TRAN that is payable in September, October of 2013, but it did come in. Okay, but we haven't had to use any of it. Not yet. Yeah, and that's the question. And Every month, uh, and it's in the board packets, we provide to the board uh, a cash flow report. And it's, it's a relatively simple one to read because I need simple. So uh, Marie does yeah. a great job of putting this together. Uh, it was, there was one for the January 16th meeting. We will not have one February 6th because, because the books will not close in time for that. So at the March 13th meeting, uh, whenever the meetings of that first week, it's hard. It, we publicly provide the cash flow. <coughs> the end of that comment is A, everybody's aware of it, and B, um, we do not at the moment predict that we will need to dip into that TRAN until June. June. Okay? And that could very well change depending upon what happens with the state budget situation and the payments, you know, based upon where we are right now, post Prop 30, what have you. However, that cash flow is predicated on the fact that Prop 30 would pass, and on that basis, through, through a, a funny thing of the way that there, the whole thing was going to happen, we actually knew that we weren't going to get a good chunk of our money until 13, 14. But all bets are off now. It's a different world. It's a different scenario. So we just don't know yet. So we may need to dip into that money on, in June. We may not. But as Marie just said, we have to pay it back October. Yeah, September, October, September, 50 percent, fifty percent in September and fifty percent in October. Right, and then the next question will be: Do we think we'll need another tax revenue anticipation note borrowing? Next year. And we, at the moment, I don't. at the moment, we don't know. Uh, I wouldn't think so, but we really don't know. And by the way, we borrowed ten million. Cerritos borrowed twenty-two, I think. There are a lot of yeah. a lot of people yeah. borrowed a lot Glendale more. Borrowed too. Yeah, a school lot of districts in particular, I have no idea how they're going to pay this money back. But uh, a lot of people borrowed more. And what was the rough cost of borrowing that? Just, I mean, ballpark. What was the interest rate? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was very, very low, and the rough, low. but the 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 the, the, um, the cost was a was somewhere between eighty and a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But the uh, the interest rate that Laco pays us on the on the ten million is what, Marie? It's currently running at 07 percent. Right. So it's less than one percent. No. Back in the day, people used to use trans for arbitrage reasons. They would borrow cheap, invest, and make money. So but that, that's that 0.7 percent interest you're making on it is actually helping pay back. That's right. Part of that mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty. So it won't even cost you that much. Very very little. And the point is, it was it was like really really cheap term insurance. You know what I mean? Yeah. By the time. Yeah. Now I will tell you that Marie and a couple of her staff and Renee, the the hoops we had to jump through, right, Marie? To get that money, I mean the cash flows, the spreadsheets. I mean it was it was it was hard, but uh, but we did it. Thanks. Or they did it. Now, if you pay it back early, would the interest be cheaper uh, for what you borrowed, or is it just a flat rate? Uh, that's a good question. I think I think we could pay it back earlier if we wanted to, and probably save a little bit of money. But it's really not that worth it. I don't remember, Marie. Do you well, know? Well, it depends. Yeah. I mean, on my background of bonds. Okay, since this is a trans. If it is callable, then you can pay it back early. But if it's not callable, it has a fixed term. So I have to read the whole. Penalty? I the have whole. a feeling it's a fixed term because RB Capital, which is the entity that we use in many, many other districts, they put this thing together through LACO. And uh, frankly, it's not as profitable for those entities that um, provide these funds, those big, uh, wherever the money comes from. And therefore, probably it is a fixed term. Mm -hmm. Based upon that, especially considering it's a very short term, it's yeah. one year. Yes, exactly. So it's, pr it's probably not called. Uh, the other question I have: You said that uh, next year is going to be the last year for the parking structure for for the COP. Yeah. To pay unless we refinance it. Right. So is, is that money going to be available then that the students are paying, or that's still parking fee? So that's still restricted. We have an ed code to follow that we can only use parking revenue for related activities. It doesn't automatically roll over to the general fund. We right. can't do that. Mm -hmm. It has it's still restricted money. It has very specific purposes. Right. So if you went into lot C and you saw the cracks in there right yeah. now, what you what we what we'll have, because that certificate of participation we paid off, we'll have that much more money to maintain that parking lot, as an example. But we can't put the money in the general fund. But how, how much are we paying right now? What, what is the amount that we owe, and how much are we going to? Principal and interest. When I paid last August, it's a, it was about six hundred thousand plus. So if we were pay one year more, that will be for the one more year about almost similar. That's fully paid. Then year fourteen fifteen. Then there's a time we won't be paying that anymore. Six hundred thousand roughly. Roughly so, yeah, plus. Yeah. It's a plus. Yeah. yeah. So that that's that's money that we're spending now that we won't need to be spending. Yeah, but what but what Marie was saying is though it has to go back into I, I understand. Yeah. It's a general fund. Yeah, we can't use that money for but um, but we can use it to pay for things that we would have been paying for anyway out of the general fund, so that's it's right. it's, it's money. Fungible. It's so money, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. And then the question uh, becomes um, and, and Marie alluded to it, that we need to get with the uh, uh, his name is Rod Carter with RB Capital and look at any possible refinancing opportunities with the, even our existing bonds, our Measure P money and everything else because every once in a while you should look at that to see if we can do a little better. So that's on the, on the agenda too. Mm -hmm. it, it, I'm sorry, but wh which way is that? Because I thought the, it, was, it was a fixed item that the uh, uh, property owners are going to pay so much for so many years. Yeah. on the bond, but you're saying that you can refinance that? And well, that for example, in the current Measure P, uh, it was a $150 million bond uh, through refinancing. They were able to generate another $24 million, give or take, $24, so million. I have to look at it's the like, series. I think it's like 174 175 or whatever. That, that, in, so somewhere along the path here, it was decided to do that, and uh, uh, I don't know if I, I, do, 
I think what happened is they were just able to refinance at a lower rate and still cash out. I don't think there was anything tied to extending the amount of the, the term. There are some districts that did that, particularly a couple of K-12s down in San Diego area, down the Newport Beach area that uh, uh, turned, and I'm, I, these are not the exact numbers, but took a $20 million indebtedness and turned it into $80 million over the scope of 40 years to pull money out now. And there, there were several districts that did that. Because I was surprised, because I thought the state is the one that financed the bond, or sold the bonds for you. No, you sell them yourself on the private market through the through through companies that do this kind of thing. There are state bonds, like for example, the U building. The money that might come to the U building is is a state bond, uh, and the state does pay that back. But in the case of when when our district or when when uh, community college districts or school districts do. Uh, measures to finance schools construction projects that's a local bond issue that they do that that particular district does and they take on the bonded indebtedness the district does and so in our case Pasadena Area Community College District took out bonded indebtedness for 150 million dollars that all the taxpayers who live in the Pasadena Area Community College District signed on to paying 100 bucks a year I don't know what it was but you know, that's kind of stuff that's buried in your tax bill when you get your tax bills at home. Right. Now, if you do go out for another bond, do you know about how much you're going to go out for? Oh, what, what we would do is, in this particular measure P, we would go out and just see if it makes sense to try and refi what we're doing now. But if we went out for another bond, uh, that's part of the, the, that's why you do a facilities, a Centennial Facilities Master Plan. Because in that master planning process that does environmental scans internally and externally and throughout the community, you determine what it is you want to do, and then you put a dollar value to that. Maybe it's 100 million, maybe it's 200 million, maybe it's whatever, and then you determine whether or not you can sell that to your electorate, and you and you put a campaign together to try to do that. But you have, to, that, but that's why that planning process is, has got to be done first. Now is this a 2020 plan, or is it going to be a 20? 25? Well, let's see. We're 90 years old in two years, right? As a campus. I think it's 12 years from now. So that would be 2025, give or take. That's when we're. What, what, when was this? Does anybody know when the college was incorporated? 100 years? I think it's 1924. 24. Then, then it is. Then it is. It would be 2024. Okay. That's, that's the idea. Yeah. 13 minutes, I'm being told. Okay, I'll tell you what, we could, we, I, got a, I got a lot more than 13 minutes here. We can defer this if you want, or I can quickly go over. This is a, um, uh, when I, I had a chance to go up to, um, here, let's do this real quick. Sure. Um, these are, uh, meeting notes. I had a chance to, uh, uh, Marie and I and Joe went up to the ACA and ACBO. ACA stands for the uh, Association of California Community College Administrators. ACBO is the Association of Community College Business Officers. Mm -hmm. And at that meeting, uh, about 200 plus of us sat in a, in, a, in a hotel conference room and listened to representatives from the Chancellor's Office, uh, the Department of Finance, uh, the Legislative Analyst's Office, uh, and uh, an entity, um, a, a person from what's known as School Services of California, which is a, a, a not-for-profit uh, consulting firm that many, many schools and colleges use in the state to help them out. The long and the short of it is that in the order in which the presentations took place, I took these three pages worth of notes. And if I do say so myself, they are very good snapshot of where we are right now as a state from uh, people who were very, very much of a like mind. The Chancellor's Office, the Deputy Chancellor, and Dan Troy, the Assistant uh, uh, Chancellor for Fiscal and, and, uh, and Planning, um, representatives from the Department of Finance, representatives from the Legislative Analyst Office, uh, data wonks and what have you. And if we had the time, I would go through this with you and you would, you, would, you would get a very clear sense of, of, of the thinking right now relative to the state budget. So what we can do is uh, we can just hand these out now and at our next meeting we can actually go through this and by that time I'm sure we'll have an update 
But it's really worth taking a few minutes of your time just to read through this. If you have any questions, you can email me or what have you. We can kind of go from there or stop me in the hall, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, and then uh, at the next meeting, um, I have a, a nifty PowerPoint that was prepared by School Service of California that is basically the governor's proposals for the 2013-14 state budget in education. I'll ask Cindy to send everybody a link to this. But uh, this is a good overview of the state budget situation right now. One of, it's an excellent one. And um, we can go over this again at the next meeting. Or if you have questions, you can shoot them, you can shoot them to me, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, the bottom line is, particularly when you read these notes, is that there's a lot of changes coming. And they're real, and they're substantive, and they'll be coming over the next two to five years in some form or fashion. Uh, the Student Success Task Force recommendations, those are in one form or another, from absolutely as they are written to um, considerably renegotiated, but, but all 22 of them are likely to happen in one form or another. Um, and so that's something for us to be aware of, and, and that's spoken to in here. Uh, um, another thing that's... Has everybody here read the Student Success Task Force recommendations? That might be good when you're reading the budget, so maybe we could get that sent out with the budget so that we're all kind of informed and on the same page, because pretty much everything, both accredi accreditation standards and budgeting standards are going to be impacted by that document. Right, good point. So we'll, we, we, can, we, can talk, we can talk about that. Uh, but in, this, in, in these notes, these priorities, there's a lot of things in here that relate to what's known as SB 1456, which is this uh, Student Success Task Force bill that speaks to registration priority and, and, and a number of other things. Um, okay, so with that said, uh, this is a good document. This is a good PowerPoint document. Um, the meeting schedule for BRAC, uh, Cindy was kind enough to prepare one for us. So um, you'll see that we're going to, we're going to, for now, we're going to go back to the once a month thing until there's a need to go twice a month. Um, and we're going to try to make these meetings as substantive as we possibly can uh, going forward. So with that said, anything else for the good of the group today? Any other questions, comments? I appreciate it. I did read this Brown article in the Times. I shared it with my students. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> the one thing that stays true, even though we want to change things, is that 80% of our students come in without the basic skills they that's need. Exactly right. And that's heavy. And how to deal with that yes. is on my mind a lot. Yeah, and, and, and to, to, to <laughs> piggyback on that, Governor Brown has stated that he's about education, K-16, through he's about health care. This is a budget that supports education and health care. And this is a governor who is riding a wave of great popularity, he's riding a wave of great success, and this is a state that has a Democratic Assembly and a Democratic State Senate. So they're focused on that. And, and uh, Chancellor uh, Harris last night talked about that 80-20 thing. And he said that is one of the massive challenges of the system. How do you deal with it? So, again, when you read these notes, I wish I had more time here. Um, Remember the old matriculation dollars? Mm -hmm. That got stripped out of the budget for the, in the last seven or eight years? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the $197 million that's coming back to this system, we should not make the mistake of thinking we're all going to get that back as 01 general fund money. A chunk of that money is going to be stripped away for what will be matriculation 2.0. Very specific money that is funded to uh, assessment, educational plan development, basic skills courses, but not necessarily the traditional basic skills courses, but the stretch model stuff and the modularized stuff and the supplemental instruction stuff, the stuff that is much more targeted to get people through the system in a much more efficient way. The travesty, my words, nobody else, is about what we do now is that we force students into a system. Well, for example, most of us, if we were faced with taking the college algebra and, uh, math assessment test right now, we'd all flunk it. I know I would, right? Okay. Well, Keith would probably be okay. Yeah, Keith would be okay. But most of us, most of us would. And part of it is because we take math 
in the ninth and 10th grade, we stop out for two years, and then we're expected to remember it when we take the assessment, right? And it, most of us don't, if we don't do this every day. Well, part of the big, the big push is going to be to align K-12 with community colleges so that the students don't come into us with that kind of liability. I mean, we got students in the room here, right? The one you, you took your algebra in ninth or tenth grade, and you're, then you're expected to remember that when you take your your this, and you don't. I don't. I couldn't. Um, and the, and the same thing with certain English. So, for the first time, there's to use that expression, the policymakers, the governors, the, everybody, everybody's got religion about what the real problems are, and they truly, truly, truly are focused on getting to the root causes of these things and investing in, try, in, in trying to fix that. And that's what I think we're going to see over the next five years. <coughs> that's why the whole system is going to transform in a lot of very significant ways. So it's going to be an exciting time over the next, over the next few years. There's a lot of things that are finally going to happen that people like Keith have been telling you for years you wanted to see happen, mm -hmm. not necessarily as a faculty member, just as a taxpayer you wanted to see happen. So, all right. Just a quick question. Is there going to be more of open discussion maybe for how to move forward with students coming in at lower level grades of classes to try to get the students' perspective on things as well? Because I think it's there's a lot to say when you come from, not always, but maybe a public school where you feel like you weren't prepared enough just because some of the resources weren't there. Um, and I think if we start to have an open discussion with our students, it's a great way to move forward, as well as hear teachers' perspectives. Because sure. I know I went into English 100, and you know sometimes you need more work on grammar and the fundamentals of writing. If you don't know where a comma goes, how do you expect to write a college level paper? Right. I, I think that um, you heard kind of the recommendation that's coming out is through the programs and pathways that we're developing, yeah. where people are getting recruited from high school, getting mentored in over the summer, and then getting implemented. The other half of it, though, is making sure that all of our faculty are able to teach reading, writing, uh, oral communication skills and quantitative literacy no matter what discipline you're in. And that takes a level of professional development that our faculty have to start to own up to. So for example, it's not uncommon to hear some faculty say, well, I teach, and please don't think I'm thinking of somebody specifically, but I teach history, I don't teach writing, right? But you're graded on a paper, yeah. right? And so it, we have to start to make sure that our pedagogy is aligning to make sure that our students are succeeding, and that's the other portion. Yeah, and I've seen Pathways work. I'm in Pathways currently. Um, I'm paired in Ujima, and um, I'm in Pathways for my mathematics, and I've gone to the TLC, and I've gotten assistance. And I've seen a dramatic shift. So I think there's a lot to be said for those programs to help students who are coming in from a high school environment now to sort of get acclimated with college so we don't get lost in the system. Right. Right. And we're trying. And then <coughs> one of the other things I know that the chancellor is very concerned about, as is the Board of Governors, is the students that are in the system now. And the fact that they don't get caught in the gap. Mm -hmm. So whatever changes are going to be made, they've got to be made in a way that, are, that, that, that recognize we've got to get those that are in the so-called pipeline through. And we can't penalize them because they're here now and not five years from now. So uh, again, the good news is is that people are finally dealing with the issues, and they haven't been for a long time. But I would say we need to listen to you, students. We need to hear your voice, and we need to have a, a formal way of, of listening. And uh, just in the paper today, the question we asked students about online classes, if you <coughs> read, read all those responses, you really hear a lot of very interesting things about students who can handle, handle online, people who can't stand them, et cetera, and everything in between, and why. So we do need to listen to you. We learn more and we're better at what we do when we do listen to you. And we invest in, in the improvement. I mean, in that particular area, we've added an instructional design faculty member. We yeah. probably need at least one or two more. Yeah. We've added another a support person uh, over there. So I know they're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, have you heard anything come down the pipeline about them wanting to move uh, vocational ed out of uh, the community colleges? Well, it's the other way around. The governor's proposal is he wants to move all adult ed uh, from the K-12 to community colleges. Now, again, last night, Chancellor Harris, he worries about that. And, and by the way, the K-12s don't want to give it up. Because what was once a $900 million a year funded operation is now down to $300 million. So they want to take it, and there's only 9 to 14 community colleges that even do adult ed right now. 
They want to take an underfunded system, they want to put it on the back of the community colleges, and they say, good luck, you know, we're going to give you 30 cents on the dollar to do what you need to do, and, and by the way, we expect you to do it better. So the chancellor's not thrilled with that, the K-12s are not thrilled with that, and I would suspect that of those, of all the things that are out on the table right now, that could be the one that, that doesn't really see the light of day. I could obviously be very wrong. Yeah. No, I meant like, you know, the, the Carpenter program, the, uh, oh, the CTE auto shop. program? <laughs> yeah. The Career and Technical Education? Right. Uh, well, there's a lot of, lot of discussion and a lot of efforts into truly, go ahead, Penelope. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, well, at this point, we're now looking at moving towards 21st century yeah. technology. And so there is a big push, and that mm -hmm. now we're going to start to see that CTE and STEM are going to wind up getting aligned a lot because yeah. a lot of what we might cons have consil uh, con considered uh, skilled labor 20 or 30 years ago, the mo like what it takes to do skilled labor has changed, and now it requires a significant portion of math and science to be able to do some of these things, and for us, an upgrade in technology. So the fact that we still have a machine shop that's using um, machines from 1962 is kind of I thought they changed most of the machines out. No, no. no we've only got, I think <laughs> we've only got the machines, are, the new machines are known as CNCs. We might have two. Yeah. And if you go in. Yeah. yeah, so now we're looking at, and there's a big push for upgraded in terms of green building, green technology, um, uh, digital media marketing, so we're kind of moving into a more 21st century. Yeah, and, and, every, and every state's or college being uh, being almost mandated to do so by the Chancellor's office now. You know, without getting into the uh, uh, thing here, um, you know, we have, uh, we have an institutional effectiveness committee and we're going to soon have program review committee, what have you. Long Beach just unceremoniously dropped 14 of their CTE programs, just recently got rid of them. And they did, they did an analysis Carpentry and they found being one of them, hmm? Carpentry being one of them. Is that right? Was it? Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, the bottom line is, is that we're going to be forced, strong word, but I think it's a true word, to, if, again, if we can't push people out the door with certificates and get them jobs, the taxpayer, the, the policy makers are saying, well, why are we giving you money for results that are not there. Yeah, but the, uh, the skilled labor people has has to come somewhere, and community colleges do not, uh, you know, well, push you're the, the programs. You're going to have problems because you're not going to have people that can fix the lighting or whatever I, coming coming down the line. I think this is good for a long term discussion because that's going to be back to that rollover budget to answer you mm -hmm. honestly. Because the way that we do things with a rollover budget currently without using program review as a basis, right. is we keep funding programs that may not have jobs that people can go to. And we have to get to the point where we have some oversight to say, hey, are we actually training people to go into jobs? So for example, we have one program that still has a full-time class load that there are no jobs if you get a certificate in this. Likewise, we've had to eliminate our culinary arts program, and as we know, that's something that, particularly in Southern California, are lots of jobs that we could have to go into. So we don't have, based on our current budgeting system and the way that yeah. programs are currently funded, we don't have oversight. But the good news is, now we've got program review, and hopefully we can, based on program review, start to inform some of those budgeting right. choices. Right, exactly. So if the, if, the, if the faculty respond with, with a redesign of their curriculum to do the things they need to do to be a little more 21st century, then this group will have resources to help fund them so they can do that. So um, it really is. It's just it's a, it's an exciting time to be in this business, yeah. so to speak. All right. Thank you all very very much. Thank Sorry you. I was late for a little bit. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And, uh,